All right. Uh, we have Mickey Stauff and <laughs> Toby Kohlenberg uh, with We Have You by the Gadgets. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Toby. That's Mickey. Uh, here we want to talk about Windows gadgets and hitting the OS below the belt. First, a little disclaimer. Everything you're hearing is our own opinion. It has absolutely nothing to do with anyone we ever worked for, might ever work for, or happen to be working for at the moment. <laughs> Complete separation, totally done on our own time and with our own resources and everything about this. They are in no way involved. Uh, my name is Toby. I do corporate information security for a Fortune 50 company. I spend my time pen testing stuff, dealing with new tech, trying to figure out how to secure things, keeping users from hurting themselves, and trying to shore up holes in the dikes. My name is Mickey. I used to uh, work for a Fortune 50 company. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the pen test firmware and hardware, a little bit of software. Today we're going to run through a bunch of different areas about gadgets. Uh, first we're going to talk a bit about what they are, how they work, some history, all that sort of stuff. Then we're going to get to go in and start talking about what's wrong with them. First how you can use them uh, maliciously and then how you can exploit them. We'll give you a couple demos, assuming everything works. We'll actually give you live demos. If they don't, we've got videos that we'll use instead. Uh, we've, I think, done all the right rituals to make the demo gods happy, so hopefully we'll manage to do that. Uh, finally, we'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions and what we think the uh, options are for dealing with this problem, both in this space and in others. So, uh, uh, a few thank yous. Um, Many pieces of this research is based on work of others, and we would like to acknowledge a few. Um, this is a, not a complete list. Uh, we apologize if you forgot someone, but we know we forgot people. Yeah, we know we forgot. Um, Itzik, FX, Ian, Jason, Street, the SoftSec people, yeah. The entire SoftSec crew. Wim, Aviv, Gal, who's sitting here and a whole bunch of others. So, thank you. Okay. Good to do it without you. So, a little bit about what gadgets are. Uh, it was interesting, when we started doing this work, uh, we realized that fewer geeks probably were familiar with gadgets than in fact teenagers. We started talking to, I started talking to friends of my children, and they all knew what gadgets were, even though a lot of the people I worked with had no clue. Fundamentally, a gadget is just a tiny little application. It runs on your desktop. You may have seen these. You've certainly seen it advertised in places. You've got ones that'll give you performance monitoring. You've got ones that are an RSS reader. You've got the uh, weather. The common ones are stock tickers and that sort of stuff. They're really very simple little things. They range from uh, simple clock gadgets to uh, uh, GPU performance gadgets that talk to drivers directly. Yeah. A little history. Uh, the first documented evidence or documented references we've seen to something like this was in the Windows XP as the uh, active desktop concept. Interestingly, in the last couple days talking to people about this, uh, a couple people have said that they've heard about, they remember this being in Windows 98 as the uh, same concept. I haven't seen proof. Mickey hasn't found any evidence of it, but it wouldn't surprise us if it was actually there as well. In uh, Vista, they actually introduced the concept of the sidebar. In that case, it was a literal sidebar. And they started calling these things gadgets instead of just being an active desktop thing. Uh, it was run as a container. You literally just ran all of your gadgets along the side in a specific location. In Windows 7, they actually made a number of changes to it. They made it easier to manage the gadgets. They allowed you to place them anywhere you wanted on the desktop. They actually consolidated all of them into a single process, so you could now just have the one sidebar process instead of multiple ones. They added some enterprise security features, and they did some improvements that uh, helped with development that are all pretty much relevant now for reasons that we'll get to at the end of the talk. This is an example of what the sidebar literally looked like in Windows Vista. You've got the gadgets running along the side, and this is the only place that you could put them. 
Uh, this would start when you started the system if you configured it so, and you'd have the gadgets that you chose to run. By the way, we didn't mention it. Uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. We don't mind. You're welcome, and uh, we'll handle them as you come up. If we don't get any questions, we might start asking questions. His will probably be in Hebrew, and mine will have absolutely nothing to do with technology and probably have to do with philosophy of religion, so you're better off asking us questions. This is what it looked like under Windows 7. You had the ability to move them all around. You see a Pandora gadget. This is one of the examples. Anything you could do from a web browser, pretty much, you could do in a gadget. Uh, the middle one is actually kind of entertaining. It was a uh, conversion tool, and they actually had a number of different interesting conversion capabilities. You've got a uh, gadget up in the right. This is a little piano toy, the standard stuff. Most useful gadget is the piano toy. He liked the piano. I really liked the Pandora uh, gadget, actually, quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. This is me, actually. I don't remember what I was listening to then. I think it was probably Ween. Um, anyway. Why this still matters. I'll be honest, when we started doing this research, uh, Mickey came to me, he thought this was a fun idea, and it took him a month. I think a month, yeah. Probably a month to convince me this was worth doing. I kept saying, no one's going to care. This, there's nothing new here. You run my code, I own you. You write bad code, I own you. This is not new. But he was right, and I was so wrong. So I'll say it publicly again and again, you were right. And it's recorded. Thank and you. it's recorded now. The fact is, though, that for a number of reasons, this actually really is relevant. The most important of which is that this style of development, and we'll get into how you create a gadget in a little bit, is not going away. Even though gadgets are, this style of making it easy for people who have no experience doing development to create executables, to create code for your system, isn't going anywhere. It's increasing. Uh, one of the sponsors, Mokana, is a tool that allows you to create simple applications for iOS. Now, I think they focus on security. I know nothing about them. This is all I know. But you're seeing this in smartphones. You're seeing this on Windows. You're seeing this in OS X. This style is increasing. It's not going away. And so the things that we found, we really believe, actually have significant relevance going forward. So, a little bit about creating gadgets. Okay. <clears throat> so, a, what is a gadget? A gadget is basically a zip file, as you can see. Uh, that's called cat.zip. Um, it's just a zip file that has been renamed to .gadget. That's how simple this is. This is the basic directory structure for a normal gadget. Um, according to the gadget functionality, there is an about screen, a flyout screen, uh, a main gadget, HTML, and a setting screen. And as you can see, it correlates to HTML files. Um, the gadget.xml is the manifest that defines a gadget. In, in, in it, you define the author, creator, copyrights, uh, permission, uh, permission. Uh, Default full. Yeah. In fact, Microsoft recommended and specified don't turn it to anything else. Exactly. Documentation by Microsoft said permission has to be set to full, and it's the only value. Okay. Um, the GIF file and the MP3 file, you will see it soon. JS, CSS, and images folders are just to support the HTML application from in the background. Uh, before. So y you can technically write these in Silverlight and Windows uh, uh, okay. WPF. Uh, uh, but I think we only found one gadget out of the 60 plus that we looked at and found online that was actually in anything but JavaScript and HTML. Was it one? Was it two? Uh, one or two. I don't remember. Tiny one. numbers, it, irrelevant numbers, basically. These are all written in JavaScript and HTML. This is why it's so simple, and you'll see the consequences of creating app, making it so easy to create applications. An interesting fact would be that you have a gadget creating template in Visual Studio online for Silverlight gadgets, but not for simple ones. And you see the majority of them are simple ones. It's also worth noting just quickly that uh, the format that you're seeing here, the list of files, 
isn't a strict set of requirements. This is what you'll get for the standard template, but because it's, it's basically a web page that runs on your desktop, you can just create a single HTML file with all the JavaScript in there if you want. You can put the CSS wherever you like. Uh, I think really the only requirements are the uh, gadget.xml and uh, the, uh, the HTML, HTML file, the main HTML, and you'll specify the name for that wherever you put it. So, the gadget security model. Uh, Microsoft actually provides a very detailed explanation of the gadget security model. They did a very good job of explaining this. Uh, we're not going to repeat everything they've written. There's a reference in the back of the slides that you're welcome to go and take a look at. That material is still available. And it's an interesting read. At least, okay, we thought it was an interesting read. Um, well, they basically covered everything. Yeah, they, they go into a tremendous amount of detail. Uh, code signing is possible for the gadgets, but it's not required. And again, the number of gadgets we saw that actually were signed was uh, vanishingly small. One or two out of the total number that we saw. And it was um, one vendor. Yeah. A a one vendor, vendor at Microsoft, that's it. Yeah. Very rare. Uh, you get a prompt for installing. It looks fairly similar, but uh, again, you'll actually just, uh, people will tend to look at this and think this is a gadget, not code. Uh, they're very similar to uh, HTML applications. It's probably the most relevant description. Rather than actually going through every detail, if you're familiar, uh, possibility, show of hands who's familiar with HTML applications, HTAs, great, that makes life easier, okay. so. We basically got something that's run in the local machine zone with some minor but critical differences. Uh, first, we can instantiate any ActiveX object that's on the system. Anyone. Uh, and we'll get into why that's so much fun in a little bit. We can't raise UAC, prom UAC prompts. However, uh, anything that you exec from the gadget, and you can exec, uh, can raise a UAC prompt. So it's a slight limitation, not a significant one. Secondly, it always runs as standard user. Even if you're in the admin group, even if you're escalated, it's going to start and run as uh, standard user. You'll get parental controls. It's also worth noting that because this is a locally run web app that is running basically as an IE function, uh, it has access to all of the cookies from IE. And you'll see why that's interesting in a bit. There are some enterprise controls that are available. Uh, fundamentally, you've got a couple different options. You can control these all from GPOs. You can turn off the Windows sidebar completely as a capability. Uh, you can uh, disable unpacking and installation of gadgets that aren't signed. Unfortunately, all this does is it prevents the automated installation and unpacking. Uh, it doesn't prevent somebody from manually going in and dropping it in the right directory, and it's literally just dropping it in the right directory and adding a little bit of uh, configuration. Uh, it also doesn't change anything about gadgets that are already installed. Uh, you can turn off user installed gadgets so that all they have access to are the ones that you've installed from the enterprise. And you can turn off the link that says get more gadgets. Which doesn't work by the way anymore. Right. There's nothing there so it's kind of relevant at this point. Before we go on to the attack surface, any questions about the basics of what gadgets are? Uh, about the capabilities. I'm sorry, Steve, you're going to have to stand up. <laughs> Say again? Yes. <laughs> we didn't actually need to take advantage of much of it. Well, any of HTML5, we had so many. Yeah, it was fun with not, uh, the normal HTML. I, I think the phrase embarrassment of riches is probably a good one in terms of the options and things that we were able to do. And you'll see some of that in the actual payloads that we uh, ended up creating for it. The attack surface. Uh, like we said, first we're going to talk about how you attack with gadgets and then we're going to go into uh, attacking gadgets themselves. So fundamentally, this is just an application. Yes, it's a bunch of HTML. 
JavaScript, but it's still, it's a, it's a packed zip application that runs on your system. It can do anything any other application can do. Unfortunately, people don't see it that way. They look at this as this cute little thing. It has no impact. Uh, I never found the Smurfs cute, but Mickey did. And so he sees it as a friendly, nice reference from the childhood. Uh, Nobody pays attention. And the interesting thing is this isn't just a human gap. This is also a software gap. One of the issues is that we found antivirus doesn't really pay any attention to HTML and JavaScript uh, ActiveX on your system at all, which means that you can do things from a gadget that would immediately be flagged if you did it from a binary. Uh, and your antivirus won't complain at all. Also because of all the capabilities it has through IE, it's got full network access for whatever arcane and strange configuration your network may use. Mm -hmm. So what can you do with gadgets? Well, you can see yourself. Fundamentally, I can exec code. If I can exec code, I win. What else can we do? Well, we can open URLs. We can create files with anything we want. Uh, you can read files from anywhere you've got permissions as your standard user privilege. You can make the computer speak. You can do all sorts of entertaining things. And with that one, we'll give you a demo. Wait. Is that the Gmail? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we just see that we have internet connectivity. So what I'm going to demonstrate right now is a malicious gadget uh, functionality. It's a POC. It hasn't been fully weaponized. Um, bless you. Gesundheit. Uh, Gesundheit. Thank you. It's worth knowing a little bit of setup for here. Uh, the assumption is that the user has gone onto the system. You notice that Mickey uh, opened the web browser, that he's logged into uh, Google. His, uh, we've got a user named uh, Jack Goff, uh, who's got an account on the system, and he's logged into Gmail as, I think, almost. Who actually logs out every time they close their browser from Gmail? Every time? Every time? So <laughs> I'd say that was about a third, half of the room. I'd say we're probably the anomalies. So Jack Off is more like the rest of the world. He doesn't ever log out. Yeah. So um, interesting thing about gadgets is, well, we mentioned that they can open URLs. Uh, we didn't mention that they can send keystrokes to the screen as if they were a keyboard. Um, now, the interesting part with Gmail is if you go into Gmail and the settings, let's see if I can show you right here. You can enable keyboard shortcuts, but you have to go into the settings, wait it to load, go a little bit down, see keyboard shortcuts. Now, in this account, they are off. What the gadget does is simply open the URL from Gmail with adding uh, a simple variable to the query string, kbd equals one, and it enables the keyboard shortcuts. Um, I just hope this works and that doesn't fail. Okay. That's a Neon Cat gadget. I apologize for the sound if you can hear it. I told him not to do it. Oh, this will do it. <laughs> Open Gmail. You're an evil man. Go to contact, select all the contacts. Create a new email, add a subject, download this, and send it. Now I'll save you the music. Thank you. So we, we do want to, or I want to make a point. We've gone back and forth on it. This doesn't have any reflection on Google. The fact that you can do all of this through URLs is standard for any web-based application. What you're seeing here is, and what we want you to realize here, is that the fact that you have all of the cookies and all the capabilities of the running browser 
and you're still running code from another source, and by the way, you may not be running the code that you thought you were running, uh, that's the issue here. Anything that you're getting over a web browser, whether you've got keyboard shortcuts, they're going to be able to find a URL that lets you do something interesting one way or the other. And all of this was done in about 20 lines of code. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to actually, this, so there's your demo of the uh, malicious gadgets. I think you can take it from there in terms of what's possible. As you, we walk through attacking gadgets, you'll see some more of what's actually possible. Fundamentally, gadgets are code. Gadgets are vulnerable. We've got a fundamental script here. Step one, search for gadgets online. Step two, analyze them. Step three, step four, profit. We got an extra step out of this one. What we actually found was when we were downloading them and starting to research this, there was a ton of malware out there uh, attempting to be gadgets, uh, claiming to be gadgets. We also found that very few gadgets used SSL. In fact, the only consistent place that we saw SSL used was when the servers they were connecting to required it. Uh, otherwise, it was inconsistent, uh, weak at best, and in one really interesting example, uh, it was poorly used. Yeah, there was one example of SSL use that the servers hosted the same file and non-SSL, and you just the yeah, SSL strip and you get the file. Right. Simple. Uh, so you could, you'd see the request and you could respond without it. Uh, we saw a lot of ad server connections. So I'm a, I'm a packet junkie to some extent and I, I love digging into the traffic. I just found a bunch of interesting stuff there. The ad server connections that you never see any references to or any indications of or any requests for approval for or any use for from these things, there were a lot of them. Uh, parking domain sites, kind of unusual stuff. Uh, there were a couple primary producers uh, with shared code between them. In some cases, they were using tools that automated the production of gadgets, but in a couple cases, uh, there was literally one night, I think, I was looking through the source and I was seeing URLs that looked almost identical for multiple domains, and different base domains, and the paths were word for word, letter for letter identical. And I grabbed Mickey and I was like, this, this is very strange. I started looking into it further. Uh, the domains have no links apparently between them and then you start looking at who is and it turns out that they're the exact same one and they're being hosted in the same location. So the interesting result is that if you start finding something on one, you're going to find it on more than one. This is also something when you start dealing with frameworks or any of the tools that to make it easy to do development is going to occur more and more. Does anyone here remember the ASN1 bug? The ASN1 bug, yeah, I see some heads. So the, the irony here was that the US government produced an ASN1 reference library and everyone instead of actually using it as reference just used it and it happened to have a fundamental flaw that then propagated into everywhere that has ASN1. Well, when you're using frameworks and uh, application building toolkits like this, you're going to see rep replication of code and replication of mistakes. In general, we saw, like I said, a bunch of really poor security practices. It was very clear that these were in the most, uh, in most cases, written by either web developers or people who had no background in development at all. You could actually see the difference between the organization from somebody who was a developer and had a very object-oriented perspective, it broke things out, versus somebody who just did web design and so pretty much had an HTML page. Uh, we had lots of ways to inject code. We found that I mean, Microsoft says default permissions for full and they never actually talk about anything else. It was one of the odd places. In general, their security recommendations around this were really strong, but that was one kind of an anomalous spot. Yeah. Uh, traffic sniffing was really easy and interestingly enough, they were surprisingly easy to spot. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is an interesting um, find. Turns out that in 64-bit uh, uh, Windows 7 platforms, uh, which I believe is the most common used OS right now. Don't call me on that. We uh, have unofficial numbers. Every request sent by the sidebar process, actually by any gadget under the sidebar process, under a 64-bit OS, will send a HTTP header called UA-CPU, which I had to Google because I had no idea what that is. It's a, it's a header that says this is a 64-bit OS. But the, the only thing, the only place that it is used in is gadgets. So all you got to do is 
look for that header and every request being sent and you know it came from a gadget. So for the traffic sniffing, uh, as we all know, it's really hard to do SSL well. It's so complex and there isn't good documentation and it's just difficult. So most of the gadgets that we found pulled their content without SSL, as I mentioned. In some cases, including their code updates. And since their code is just JavaScript, even if they weren't pulling full code updates, they were still pulling their JavaScript and HTML and clear text. This makes life pretty simple for you as an attacker. Uh, since we already have a way to identify the header or the, the packets coming from it, we can just look for the uh, HTTP uh, agent string and start injecting our own materials into it. Basically, pull up Airpon and look for uh, the header and .js files. You can replace it with well, anything you want. Anything you want. Uh, in this case, we actually used a proxy instead of Airpon just because uh, the race condition for Airpon or any of the other side uh, injections gets a little sketchy for demos and we like consistency. Oh, you like it cons more than me. I like consistency. So like we said, we used a proxy, so we are going to set the proxy configuration. This is just for the sake of ease of proof of concept. This is not a requirement. If you were actually doing this in the wild, you could very easily just do an injection attack from the side by watching for the traffic. It would not be difficult at all. This just happens to be easier for the demo purposes. Okay, so we have the Windows 7 machine and we have a very useful, very effective gadget we call the piano. Um, we got this from the Microsoft Live Gallery before it was uh, yeah. retired. And we're now going to demonstrate what does it mean to intercept and inject something to a gadget um, and using ActiveX controls. So. For the record, that's not what it's supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is what it's supposed to do. That's what it's supposed to do. You want to slide over to the uh, attack VM for a second? No, the other. So if you look, I know it's hard to read. I won't expect you guys to catch all of it. But basically what you got here is the proxy that uh, Mickey uh, t took and manipulated and corrupted and turned into a, a, an evil, nasty little tool that we love. Uh, and it's watching all of the requests coming through. It's identifying a request for an update. By the way, we did try to reach out to this vendor. Every vendor that you see listed here, every developer that you see listed or referenced, we tried to get in touch with and we tried to give significant warning to. Uh, we got responses from a couple, but uh, not many. Yeah, two. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we did a try to talk to all of them. It sees the request. This is literally what it's just going to pull down as an update for itself. It responds with malicious code, and you hear this computer talking. Uh, to the you. text to speech is three lines of code. Let's see, escape one here. Kill the proxy? Uh, we'll do it in a second. Okay. So. Oh, that's nice. Um, sure what Mickey, uh, does that do it? That did it, we think. Um, 
Uh, look a mouse. Okay, yep. there we go. No point winners. Technology is hard. Okay, so uh, you saw a demo, simple proxy. You also saw fundamentally that you can inject whatever you want. Well, among other things, you can inject JavaScript, anything you want, or PowerShell, or anything else that you care to write to the local system. Uh, He's much more of a developer than I am. I'm a, I'm, I write code by necessity, so some of the stuff you're going to see is just a really ugly hack together. Uh, it's all my fault. His code is beautiful. Uh, the other piece of this is that we did a tremendous amount of pipe fitting. I want to actually recognize the recent work done on PowerShell policy bypass um, by the, I want to say the zero entropy guys, as well as, I'm trying to remember the other blogs, really useful. We were actually stuck on this until the work actually came out and we started using it to take advantage of this. Let's see if we can actually switch back. Okay. That's it. That's what I already said. Oh, you're playing the cache. Okay. So uh, the, the funny thing is if you attack a gadget, it will store it in a cache. Like if you malicious JavaScript, it will keep going and going and going until you clear the cache. Okay. So we just got a different payload that we're going to load. Uh, what you're seeing here in the bottom right is the proxy that we wrote, Mickey wrote, uh, that'll deliver the malicious payload. In the upper right, we've got uh, Metasploit running, waiting for uh, reverse connect back. We just took some really simple steps. It's literally just standard interpreter reverse TCP. You could get really creative with this. You could do all sorts of things. We just stayed simple. Uh, left is a simple web server that's available to allow us to download the binary that we want to execute. Uh, again, uh, I'm sure there are lots of people who would be able to embed the entire binary into the website, uh, excuse me, into the uh, actual payload we're delivering. I tried. I wasn't able to do it other smarter minds probably would no, absolutely would have no trouble with it. But this is what you see here. Um, from here, you'll see not a whole lot. For the sake of POC, you see we download the file on the desktop. It doesn't have to be on the desktop, yeah. but we did. That's all that you see. No pop-ups, no warning, no anything. Not a big deal. On the other hand, from here, you may notice you've got a request for download, and you now have an interpreter shell that's open on the system. You've got full root remote access at this point. You've just owned them completely. I like interpreter. <laughs> so, and as Mickey said, this is just POC. That's why you actually see the shell there. Yeah, we can uh, uh, as easy enough, um, easily enough put it in the start up menu or anywhere else. Uh, this was a chain of vulnerabilities. This really was an explicit chain. Uh, you can download, but if you exec from ActiveX, you'll get a warning for the user that you're trying to run unsigned code, and this is maybe a bad idea. However, if you run code from Power, is that a question? Say again? Uh, it should. I know that there are going to be some differences in terms of some of the ActiveX controls that are available, but it, as far as I know, it does. Um, we haven't tested it on Vista since Vista is like 2% ah, of the market. The question was, is this possible on Vista? Uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, it is. We didn't test it on it. Theoretically, everything, we see, everything you see here is uh, possible on Vista. Anyone from Microsoft who cares to comment? <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we going? Oh, uh, if you run code from ActiveX, you get a warning. If you run it from PowerShell, you don't. However, PowerShell's default policy is that you can't run scripts on every system. Luckily, people have been doing some really interesting work on PowerShell bypass. So if you write a batch file to the local file system that uh, cats your PowerShell script into the PowerShell process. You don't ever deal with the uh, PowerShell policy. 
And if you configure the ActiveX controller properly, such that when it exec execs code, it actually doesn't pop up a window, you don't see anything. So this is ActiveX writing PowerShell and batch files to the file system, as well as downloading a binary. The ActiveX kicks off the batch file, which kicks off the PowerShell, which kicks off the binary. It entertained us. Simple, isn't it? Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Please don't break. I broke. Okay. So, what to do about it? Fundamentally, the question is what do we do about this problem? And this is, it's not just enough to find the flaws. You have to have some idea of how you're going to do something about it. At a basic level, it's just code. Remember, code is code. It's going to be vulnerable. It's going to be potentially malicious. You shouldn't be taking candy from strangers. When I described this to my 13-year-old, she knew better than to download random pieces of code. This is the fundamental key piece. Write applications properly. Uh, the problem is that as it gets easier to write applications, you can expect that to happen less and less, which takes us to the next point. When you're writing or creating an application framework, you have to make the secure method the default. And Mickey actually took it a step further and said, when it really matters, you shouldn't be able to do anything except do it right. If you need SSL, you need to make sure that the person doing the writing of the code doesn't have a choice to not use SSL. Finally, there's Microsoft's solution, which... Yeah. Anyone from Microsoft care to go on stage and comment? No? No. Okay. We contacted them. They were great to work with, very cooperative, very supportive, and our jaws just about dropped when they said, we're going to take the feature out. Their choice. Uh, we think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, as a solution, you want to move to the App Store. Windows 8 has the app container capability, which provides a lot more restrictions. Uh, you can debate your own opinions, and uh, you know, if there's as many opinions as you want on whether app stores are good things or bad things, but the fact is that you'll get some level of code audit going on there, depending on which store you go through, and you'll have more restrictions. So there's some significant advantages to just getting rid of this feature. There also, there's really very few users for this. Uh, um, we've seen um, corporate use of gadgets. Um, because they're so easy to develop, a lot of, a lot of corporations will um, like to develop sales helping gadgets or um, inventory keeping gadgets, some, some of those gadgets that work with internal systems, which means basically the, frame, the framework is still enabled. You can install any, any gadget. Yeah. Prior work, we could not have done this without the work. Yeah, so um, these three CVEs are the work of Aviv Raf, who reported uh, remote code execution on default Windows Vista gadgets in 2007. Um, basically, what you saw with Meterpreter, only with a calc, um, five years ago. We didn't actually show him the calc payload. With a single line of ActiveX with JavaScript, you can just pop calc. Yeah. It, it, Shell.run calc. It's really simple. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of prior work here. We're, we're standing on the shoulders of the people who have done the foundational work and have done it for a long time, uh, as well, obviously, as everyone who did work on Metasploit and the PowerShell work and all of these different pieces that we've put together and turned into this. Well, two past presentations, uh, DEF CON 15 and Harrison Security. And, widgets and gadgets done by Ian and, um, and Aviv, and the uh, Jinx malware framework from Itzik and Yonatan. References, you'll find whatever information you want. We do want to point out Microsoft did a detailed document on writing gadgets securely. They talk about all of the issues. They talk about code injection. They talk about validating input. They talk about all of these pieces. Uh, they didn't, this wasn't vulnerable uh, code for lack of their trying to make it good. The extra privileges 
that was their side, but they tried as hard to get pe as they could to get people to write good code. Uh, you can also learn more about the security model if you want. At this point, that's our presentation. Uh, we're happy to take questions and please fill out the speaker feedback form.